Hello everyone, this is Rohan Shah with BestEconTutor.com and in this third module we'll be talking about supply and demand. In this video we'll be going over marginal benefit and marginal cost, shifts in supply and demand, and market equilibrium. So, marginal benefit. Um, let's look at an example here. Let's say you are buying pizza by the slice. Now here's the thing, although you'll end up paying the same price for every slice, whatever price they've listed, you're probably valuing them differently. So let's say the very first slice you buy, you're really hungry, so let's say you're willing to pay $9 for that slice. So that's a high valuation, but then the second slice you buy, you don't value it quite as high. Let's say you're only willing to pay $7 for that one. And the third slice you buy, let's say you're willing to pay $5 for that one. So what these numbers are, are marginal benefit. So marginal, the word just means next, right? So the benefit you get from the next slice. And notice the third slice really doesn't taste as good as the first right? And that's why our marginal benefit keeps going down. Our marginal benefit curve has a downward slope. Now this marginal benefit curve has another name more popularly known as demand. So that's whole fuss about the demand curve. What it really is, is that it's the marginal benefit curve. It's the benefit you get from each extra item. And it usually always goes down. The more of any good you have, the less you're going to value the next one. And that's why it's a lower and lower benefit. And that's why the demand curve is downward sloping. So what that means is if you take any given point, let's say this point two comma seven, there's actually two different ways to interpret this point. One way is to simply say that if the price of pizza was $7 each, you'd want to buy a quantity, the axes here, quantity then and price we can say. So one way to, uh, 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 interpret that is that if the price was $7, you would be willing to buy two slices of pizza. The third one wouldn't be good enough. The first and second one are both sort of good enough. You're rallying them. But another way to interpret this point then is that the second slice alone, notice not too totally, the second slice alone gives you a $7 happiness. Now let's look at the marginal cost curve or the supply curve as we'll see. Here's where it gets a little a little funny because it deviates from our real world. In the real world, you probably expect that the more slices of pizza you produce, it costs less and less to make you know, each next slice because you're getting better at making them. Well, in the world of economics, we kind of have it the other way where according to all the assumptions, and really a lot of this comes from uh, Adam Smith's uh, original theories and really you kind of have to imagine yourself in this fictional world where the next item costs more to produce than the one before. I mean, if you look at some of the old examples, it's like, you know, uh, if you're trying to make needles, the first few needles are pretty easy to produce, but when you want to make the 60th needle, you have to go out in the woods and get a lot more stuff. So really you have to spend a lot of time uh, finding materials and whatnot. So the point is opportunity cost is factored in as a cost here. And that's why one way to think about this is that Sure, the first slice of pizza, let's say, only costs you a dollar to produce. But then the second slice of pizza, now you're kind of spending a lot of time making pizza. And really, at that point, it's probably more profitable to make salads or something else. And so that's why it's a higher cost, including opportunity cost, for making the second slice than it was to make the first slice. So that's why our supply curve, our marginal cost curve, is upward sloping. And the second one, let's say, costs $3 to produce. And the third one, let's say, costs $5 to produce and so on. So this curve then is our marginal cost curve, also known as supply. So really, demand and supply are really about marginal values. The supply is the marginal cost. That's really then something that the business owner or the, su the supplier uh, has to worry about. And the demand curve is about the consumer, the benefit that the consumer gets from consuming each uh, each item and so wherever they meet is called market equilibrium and so uh, 
that we'll, we'll get to that in a bit, but that's, uh, that's how marginal cost and marginal benefit end up determining supply, demand, and the equilibrium. All right, now let's look at what type of things in the world would shift a demand and supply curve. So let's look at the demand curve for pizzas. It might seem like, let's say the price of pizza goes down, then hey, if pizza is cheaper, I want more pizzas. It might seem like that's gonna shift the demand curve to the right, meaning an increase in demand for pizzas. But that's actually not what happens if the price of pizza uh, changes. Here's the thing. The price of pizza is actually one of the axes on the demand curve for pizza. Here's how the demand curve really is made in the real world. If you were Pizza Hut and if you wanted to find your demand for pizza, you're probably just gonna have to call people up in a survey and ask them, hey, how many slices of pizza would you want if this was a price? How many would you want if this was a price? How many would you want if this was the price? So really this demand curve is the different quantities that people would buy based on different prices of your good. So if all that's happening is the price of your pizza is lowered, that's just a different point on this same demand curve that you've already made. So a change in the price of your good, yeah, you will buy more pizzas if it's a lower price, but that's on the same curve. That's called a change in quantity demanded, not a change in demand. A change in demand is the whole curve shifting. A change in quantity demanded is a movement along this curve, which happens if the price of that good changes. So what type of things then would cause a change in demand? What would cause the entire curve to shift? Well, uh, one thing is prices of related goods. So not the price of pizza itself, but let's say Coca-Cola, which we can assume people usually have as a complement to pizza. They usually have Coke with pizzas. Well, in that case, if, pizza, if uh, Coke becomes cheaper, then people will actually demand more pizza. So in that case, the entire curve for pizza, the demand curve shifts to the right. The demand goes to the right if Coke becomes cheaper. So another good does have the ability uh, another good's price changing does have the ability to change the demand for your good. Uh, now, on the other hand, if we were looking at a substitute good, meaning something that's kind of in competition with pizza, like burgers. Well, let's say burgers became cheaper. Well, in that case, you probably want to have more burgers and less pizza. So in that case, the demand would actually shift to the left. So if another good's price changes, you have to ask yourself, is that a substitute good, a complementary good, or not related at all? And based on that, you can decide whether you wanna shift your demand left, right, or not move it at all. Now, other things that could change the demand curve are income. If your income goes up, uh, here's where it gets a little funny. It kind of depends on whether your good is what we call normal or inferior. A normal good is something that you want more of when you have more income. And an inferior good is something that you actually want less of when you have more income. Like ramen noodles, for example. If you become really rich, you're probably gonna buy less ramen noodles. So if a good's an inferior good, and if your income goes up, then your demand for that good shifts to the left. But if pizza is a normal good, well, in that case, if your income goes up, the demand will shift to the right, and if your income goes down, the demand will shift to the left. So when there's an income change, first ask yourself, is this good normal or inferior? And based on that, you can shift the demand. Uh, other things that could change the demand curve are really just uh, changes in preferences, which could happen. Uh, a celebrity endorsements, if a celebrity endorses a good, then that'll make people want it more. If there's more consumers in a town, then the market demand is more, so that shifts to the right. So rather than trying to memorize a list, which you can kind of, but it's really better to have a conceptual understanding. What will make me want more of this good, even if its price didn't change, right? Because a price change is just moving along it. So if something makes you want more of it, even at the same price, that's what's gonna cause the shift. Now let's look at things that will change your supply curve. Well, similarly, a change in the price of this good alone won't change the supply curve. That'll just be a change in quantity supplied. You're just moving from one point to another. But let's say tomato sauce becomes expensive and it's used to make pizza. Well, here's what happens. Your cost of producing pizza now goes up. If you own a pizza store and you're making pizza, your costs are now higher. So all these Y values uh, your costs are higher, so your new curve is kind of above the old one. Here's, a, here's one thing to keep in mind though for shifting the supply curve. Whenever costs go up, your curve is moving upwards, but that's really a decrease in supply because you're moving left. For every price, you're supplying less quantity uh, of that good. And so really, rather than thinking up or down at all, for, for this whole process of shifting supply or demand, 
You could just try to think of it as a left and right word shift. So anytime there's a decrease in supply or demand, your curve will shift to the left. And anytime there's an increase, it shifts to the right. So here again, your cost went up, so it's physically moving upwards, but it's really just a shift left, as you can see. So uh, here, what are all the things that could cause a supply curve to shift? Well, it's mostly based on the cost of production. So notice it has nothing to do with the demand for the good, right? If Barack Obama endorses a product, sure, a lot more people might demand that product, but that doesn't affect the supply curve one bit because the cost of producing it won't change. Now, on the other hand, let's say, you know, your input good like tomato sauce became expensive or even workers' wages go up. Well, in that case, it's still, it's now gonna cost you more to produce a good because you have to pay your workers more. So that will also cause a leftward shift in the supply curve. Technology, if your technology go, increases, for example, and makes you more efficient and better at producing things, then your supply will shift to the right. So really, for supply curve shifts, again, rather than trying to memorize a list, just try to think, will this make it easier or cheaper to produce the good? And if so, your supply moves to the right. Now let's look at an example where supply and demand both shift simultaneously, and we have to figure out what happens to the equilibrium price and quantity. Now here's the thing, whenever one of the curves shifts, uh, it's unambiguous, meaning it's clear what happens to the price and quantity. If demand increases, for example, the equilibrium P and Q, the X and Y value both go up. If supply increases, for example, then uh, the equilibrium price will go down, but the quantity will go up. You can always just draw a graph one at a time. But if both graphs shift at the same time, then one of them might be ambiguous where uh, you know, it could go up or down depending on which curve shifts more. The best way to do these problems is to not really worry about graphing them together because then it'll be hard to keep track of which one's ambiguous. So here, the best way to do it is one by one and just kind of to track the end result. So let's do that over here. So let's say in the market for suits, ties, which are a complement, you wear them with your suit, uh, ties become cheaper. Well, in that case, the demand for suits will increase. So that's your demand shifting up. So your D goes from D1 to D2. So your demand increase causes your price to go up, as we see from here to here, the equilibrium Y value goes up, price increases, and the quantity also increases, your X value increases. But let's say it becomes uh, your, uh, wa your employers have a, employees have a higher wage, and so your supply shifts to the left. So your S goes from S1 to S2, so no matter whether you look at this one or this one, either way, what's happening is your quantity is going to the left and your price is going up. So whenever the supply decreases, that alone will cause the price, as we can see, to increase and the quantity to decrease. So if we look at these shifts together, both of them on their own are causing the price to go up so we can be sure that the price definitely increases but the quantity, one shift makes it go up, the other shift makes it go down, so the quantity is ambiguous. It could go up, down, or stay the same. Now let's look at what's called the market demand curve. Well, let's say these are two demand curves for two individual people. If we wanted to, and if they're the only two people that make up the market, and if we wanted to find the market demand curve, what we do is called horizontal addition. What that means is, for any given price, let's say for a price of two, we know that this customer demands six items, because that's a point on their demand curve. This customer for that same price of two will demand 10 items. So what we need to do is add those two numbers, add the six items that they demand and the 10 that they demand, and so the market as a whole will demand 16 items at a price of two. So that then is a point on our market demand curve. The only other point we'd know of then is that at a price of one, they'll demand 10 items, and they'll demand 12 items. So at that price of one, uh, the market demands 10 plus 12, which is 22. So one comma 22 will be a point there. So that's what our market demand curve will look like. So notice that we add up the quantities for all the individuals, and that's how we get the market demand curve. And same with supply. You just add up the X values for a given price on the supply curve, and that's how you get the market supply curve. Now let's look at market equilibrium. I said earlier that the equilibrium is where supply and demand meet. So for example here, if supply and demand meet at 10 comma three, that means that in the equilibrium, 
10 items will be sold for $3 each. Now, what if the price for some reason was not $3? Let's say it was only $1. Well, then what we have is what we call a shortage and the market's not in equilibrium because just looking and in, zooming into that demand curve, it has this point over here, which means at a price of one, 12 items will be demanded. But at that same price of one, people will only want to supply five items. So really, since they're not the same number, there will be a shortage of, of seven items because again, people want 12, but only five are made. So there's that shortage. And noticing the shortage, the market then sort of has a pressure to keep raising the price until that shortage gets lower and lower until the price is three and there's no shortage anymore. And that's when you're in equilibrium. Now here we have a question from a student. Does the supply curve have an upward slope because it costs more to make three pizzas than two pizzas? Well, there's definitely some truth to that. There, it definitely costs more to make three pizzas than to only make two pizzas. But the reason the supply curve slope upwards is because the third one alone costs more to make than the second one. So if the second one costs this much, the third one will cost even more. And that's really because the supply curve is the marginal cost curve. It's how much it costs to make the next one. So this is saying, this would be saying then that the third one alone costs more to make than the second one alone. So yeah, totally it costs more, but also marginally it costs more. Throughout this course, it's really key to make the distinction between total and marginal. Marginal is just that next one. Total is that plus everything before it. Now another question we have is, why don't we add the Y values of the supply and demand curve when finding the market supply and demand? Now, a uh, great question. The reason is because keep in mind that the X values are what represent quantity. That's our axis. And the Y value is sort of price or the dollar amount that everyone's willing to pay if you're looking at demand. Here's the thing. We're not really saying how much are you willing to pay for the first slice? How much are you willing to pay for the first slice? How much are you willing to pay for the first slice? And adding up that number. Uh, we're really just adding up everyone's quantities, not everyone's dollar amounts. Now, towards the very end of the course, we're gonna look at what we call a public good. And in that one, when they're all sharing something like a public library, that's when we'll add up their dollar amounts they're willing to pay and they're gonna pay for it together. But for now, when we're looking at private goods, we want to add up how much quantity everyone's willing to buy and add that up and that's why it's really horizontal addition. Well, I hope you now understand economics better and if you really want to make sure you've mastered the concept, check out our active learning customized platform at bestecontutor.com. It's like having a one-on-one -on -one tutor right in front of you 24-7. You can click here to try it out for free. And we'll be adding more topics and videos on YouTube, so make sure you subscribe below for the latest updates.